Well, I just want to welcome everybody to um, actually our first Greenbelt Alliance virtual outing, urban space to open place. And my name is Ken Levin. I'm the outings coordinator for Greenbelt Alliance. And you can see, well, if you haven't heard of Greenbelt Alliance before, we've actually been around for 62 years. And as you can see, our, mesh, our mission is to educate, advocate, and collaborate to ensure the Bay Area's lands and communities are resilient to a changing climate. In normal times, we offer field outings nearly every weekend to resilient hotspots throughout the nine Bay Area counties. My co-host this morning is Jesse Brennan. She's our Director of Marketing and Communications. And throw it over to you, Jesse. Yeah, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for the kickoff of our virtual outing series. I uh, hope everyone is doing well during these times, staying safe and then being able to enjoy some downtime and relaxation and getting out into nature as you can. Um, I wanted to just take a moment to invite you all to join us on Wednesday for our Saber the Greenbelt event. We're starting that at 5.30 p.m. and it is free this year because it is online. Um, and so this one hour celebration is going to be emceed by the fabulously funny Irene Tu, and we'll also hear from guests like California's Secretary of Natural Resources, Wade Crowfoot, the Santa Clara Valley Open Space Authority's General Manager, Andrea McKenzie, and Metropolitan Transportation Commission's Executive Director, Therese McMillan. And this is really just a time for us to come together as a community, celebrate the work that Greenbelt is doing to create climate resilience throughout the Bay Area, um and you know enjoy some levity and uh some during some you know what we've all experienced as hard times so you can learn more about savor the green belt on our website um greenbelt.org forward slash savor the green belt and uh there are options to sign up and donate and learn more so we hope to see you on wednesday and with that i will turn it back over to ken thank you well our presenter this morning is bob johnson and Bob's a longtime Greenbelt Alliance board member and outings leader. And he's also the author, along with another of our outings leaders, Janet Byron, of the um, guidebook Berkeley Walks, which I think Bob has a slide of, but just in case. If you have any questions during Bob's presentation, you can use the, the Q&A tab down at the bottom of your screen, and we'll get to them either during or right after Bob's talk. And with that, I'll Throw it over to you, Bob. Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I, yes, I'm Bob Johnson. I've, I've been on the Greenbelt Board since, I think, uh, 1992, if I remember right. Um, and I've been leading outings for Greenbelt Lines and other groups for over 20 years. Um, I'm really thrilled to be part of this organization and the work that has done uh, over so many years to protect uh, large areas of open space to make our cities more livable space and our uh, our new strategic focus on making the Bay Area more resilient. Um, I live in Berkeley and uh, many of the walks have been based here um, as well as out in the Green Bella Parks and other open space. Um, a few years ago uh, my fellow outings leader Janet Batter and I, as Ken mentioned, I started pu putting self-guided versions of the walks we'd been doing in a book, which was published in 2015 called Berkeley Walks. And in 2018, the second edition came out with three more walks uh, for a total of 21 as, as well as other enhancements. Um, since then, I've been designing more walks in Berkeley and nearby towns and 18 of these are available on our Berkeley Walks website, which is berkeleywalks.com uh, for free download. Um, they are in six series, so there's three walks in each uh, series, and they're PDF files, so they can be, you can easily download them from the site for free. You can be print, printed out, or they can be viewed on just about any device, like a laptop, a, a tablet, or a cell phone. Today, uh, we'll, we have virtual walk, uh, where we will use PowerPoint slides of photos, maps, and other information to explore a route somewhat as though we were actually walking it. Um, and believe me, this is, these are routes that I've walked uh, very often because we're starting off right near my house. Um, part of today's walk is based on one of those new walks. Um, and it's in the northeast corner of Berkeley. Um, 
in the hills, a place called Berkeley Woods. Um, and for there, we take trails in Tilden Park. So we start right near my house. And one of the things I love is that in a few blocks, I can be at a trailhead um, that delves into Tilden Park. And actually, that, that trail connects up to trails that can take you all over the East Bay Hills. Um, so today's theme of urban place to open space is very much tied to what uh, Greenbelt Alliance does in, in making those things, that sort of life possible. Um, well, we, uh, we started Grizzly Peak and Creston Road near where Euclid ends at Grizzly Peak. Um, the area we'll go first, as I said, is called Berkeley Woods, and we will explore a bit of architecture as well as history of the place and some of the people who live there. When we walk in Tilden, we'll be able to explore a rich variety of uh, native plants on quiet trails. Well, there'd be me talking, so it isn't completely quiet. Um, so here's a map. Um, and we're starting off with the black circle where the arrow is um, at uh, Grizzly Peak. And um, it's actually Creston Road there is. Creston Road comes around like this. Okay, so we're going to start there. Um, and um, the full walk in that I said there's a new walk on this called uh, Berkeley Woods. The full walk actually explores some of the other streets. Uh, around in this area and has a bit more, but I think this walk uh, will give us a, a feel for, for, for this interesting neighborhood up in the Berkeley Hills. Um, you can actually get there by uh, AC Transit bus 65 bus, um, assuming it's still running. Uh, <laughs> they have cut back on service, but it's still running right now. <laughs> Unfortunately, not on weekends. Um, anyway, so we're gonna, we're gonna cross over Grizzly Peak here. We're going to go up Creston and then we bear left on Rosemont Avenue and then we're going to turn right on Woodmont Avenue. So our first stop is at 605 Woodmont Avenue. I'm sorry they've, they've, they've let their plants grow up so much you can you can barely see part of the house but it's a pretty big house in the English Tudor style and it dates from 1915. But there's a very interesting story behind this house um, in that the right portion of the house uh, was originally built for the whole manufacturing company, which makes um, agricultural and construction machinery, uh, which made, I'm not sure if they're still around. Uh, the structure was uh, part of their exhibit at the Panama Pacific International Exposition of 1915 in San Francisco. And it's pictured here. I think they've kind of blacked out the background in this, uh, in this old photo, but it was actually inside of a great big uh, pavilion um, at that exposition. Um, and uh, it was then it was used as a reception place for guests, and, it, and they had motion pictures to show people about their products as well. Uh, afterward, uh, UC professor Arthur Pope and his wife Bertha, who's a high school teacher, purchased the structure and had it barged across the bay and pulled up the hills uh, by uh, tractors and horses uh, to be the first home in this area. And there's an illustration of what somebody said that the house was going to look like. Uh, when it was placed there up uh, on Woodmont, what is now Woodmont Avenue. Um, so uh, it was um, a, a quite a large house um, that had, um, I, it, they expanded it, so it now has 5,000 square feet of space. Let me just go back one slide here. I wanted to point out the English Tudor is, you can see in the, um, in this, uh, wood here um, that's called uh, half timber, that's called half timbering. And then uh, it has this great big bay window that has lots of leather glass and all. It's quite, so it's quite an impressive house. And as I say, it's much bigger now. Okay, the other interesting thing is that afterwards, Tim Fogarty uh, lived in this house. Uh, Tim Fogarty was uh, a member uh, of the group called uh, Credence Clearwater Revival, um, which was a, a rock band that was, um, a huge success in the 1960s. Um, they made a fortune for Fantasy Records, which is based in West Berkeley. Um, although the band members said that they, they didn't think they were adequately paid by Fantasy. There was a long running feud. Um, in this photo, uh, Tom's brother, John, is at the right here. He was the lead singer in the group. Uh, Tom uh, is this guy who's second from the left. Um, he, they later broke up and Tom went on as a uh, as a solo performer after that. Um, and despite their El Cerrito upbringing, 
Uh, they adopted a kind of Southern funky style uh, for some of their hit songs, which included things like Bad Moon Rising, Lodi, uh, Have You Ever Seen the Rain, and Green River. Well, next up the hill also is another English tutor. This is at 615 Wilma. This one is from 1917, so just a little bit, two years after that other house. Um, and it was expanded in 1926. Uh, well, perhaps not as architecturally impressive as 605, the setting with the lawn and the curving drive gives it the air of an English country estate. Um, it was designed by Manetta White Brooks Daniel. She was the daughter of a distinguished zoologist at John Hopkins University. Her husband, John Franklin Daniel, was a graduate student there, um, and that's how they met. Um, they ultimately came to Berkeley, uh, where John taught for 32 years at UC Berkeley. Um, it was subsequently the home of Keith Marcellius, who was a co-founder of the software firm Autodesk. It's one of my favorite houses in the area. Um, well, quite a contrast then is 625 Woodmont, which is an all white house that's built in an L shape. Um, and there's this interest, unusual courtyard here that has a circular opening above it on, on the right. Um, this house was uh, designed by Donald Olson, who was a modernist architect and taught for many years at uh, UC Berkeley in the architecture school. Um, was, when I was on the uh, Berkeley Landmark Preservation Commission, um, we actually designated Olson's own home, um, which he also designed as a city landmark. Um, and he was quite thrilled to have that so designated well he, during his lifetime. Um, that house um, actually has floor to ceiling glass and you may have seen it on uh, San, San Diego Road above John Hinkle Park in Berkeley. It's really quite a lovely house. Uh, this house uh, was recently renovated. They, they originally was wood siding, they replaced it with stucco, but it's kept the, basically the, same, the, uh, the basic design of, of Donald Olson. Um, well, just a little farther along um, is a house at um, 633 Woodmont um, that was uh, built in 1923 of, of stucco with a tile roof. And it was the home of Professor Sidney B. Mitchell, who is pictured here. Um, he was renowned in library science and for establishing a UC postgraduate program in librarianship. Moreover, he was also a horticulturalist, and this is something very important in this area. He helped found the American Iris Society and the American Fuchsia Society, and he developed many hybrid uh, types of uh, bearded iris um, in what was originally a three acre property. Um, and actually some iris can still be seen blooming here in the spring. Now here are a couple of views uh, looking uh, along Woodmont as we proceed. <clears throat> so you can see that, well, the name Wood, uh, it gets the name one from there's, it's, it's a very heavily treed area. Um, it's quite shady uh, generally. And um, Mont, it, there's actually a, a bit of uphill and downhill <clears throat> along the, uh, the section of Woodmont that we're walking on. Um, next along is a um, uh, behind a high hedge and partly hidden by foliage is a large modernist house uh, in unpainted wood. In front you can perhaps see a low structure here with a glass roof. Well that's actually an indoor swimming pool in there, <coughs> which I discovered one time when they're doing renovations and they had uh, diagrams of the house out in front at the fence or at the, the hedge anyway. Um, and next to that and behind another hedge and also partly hidden by foliage is a large, uh, sorry, I'm on the wrong one. Um, let me just go back here. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Also uh, behind a high hedge and also hidden by foliage is this house, which is a, um, at 657 woman. This is in Monterey colonial revival style. Um, and it's been expanded since its uh, construction in 1925. It was the home of another horticulturalist, Carl Salbach, who is pictured here. Um, he had uh, gradually given up management of a typewriter company to focus on flowers. Um, he bought four acres of land to the north and east of this house, and he also acquired the iris stock of his neighbor, Professor Sidney Mitchell. Um, 
So, and there were also flowering cherries, rhododendrons, and other plants in a lovely garden and nursery, um, which was still here until Salbach retired and the land was subdivided. And there you can see him with uh, holding some irises. Um, on the other side of the street, um, there is a tree of houses, uh, 660 Woodmont is one of those. The others are 664 and 666 Woodmont. <clears throat> and they're all around from 1953, designed by Roger Ewan Lee, who is pictured there, in the location of another former nursery. So there were quite a few nurseries in this area originally. Um, Lee designed more than 100 homes, mostly in the East Bay of the Bay Area and also in Hawaii, um, providing thoughtful modernism for middle-class buyers. Um, it's built on a hillside. They're, all three are built on the hillside, and they place the open garages beneath the homes. Um, there's a combination of flat and angled roofs um, and an open plan with a patio in the back that really becomes kind of an uh, extension of the indoor living space. Um, they're very factual, fraction, uh, functional, attractive homes. I got to visit one of them during a, a kind of uh, open house tour in the area. Um, and Lee was one of the first Chinese Americans to gain prominence in California as an architect. Shortly after that, on the left, uh, is, is we take a street called Vistamont, which kind of turns and goes back the other way. So we're going back parallel to, to, to Woodmont. Um, and uh, we go along the street, it doesn't go too far before it, it turns to gravel, uh, but we keep on. And on the left side um, is uh, what's actually the other side of the house we saw on Woodmont that had the swimming pool, the indoor swimming pool. Um, and it has each side of the gate, it has these big trellises uh, with, with uh, wisteria vines. And actually, um, it, the house looks actually even bigger and more impressive from this side. Well, we keep going and we come to a point where um, there's a driveway going off to the left to one house and there's a driveway with a gate on the right going to the other house. And between them is a path. Uh, it's a public path uh, called Vistamont Trail. The, the sign is up here. Um, so Vistamont Street ends here and it becomes a path. And the path is uh, first made up of these kind of round sections of concrete as stepping stones. And then later on, they're actually what look like flat pieces they've taken off of sidewalks um, as continuing uh, stepping stones. I'm not quite sure why the street doesn't go through, uh, whether it was something about the land ownership or the fact it kind of goes down and there seems to be a, a kind of drainage area. But in any case, it, uh, it doesn't go through as a street, but you can get through as a, a, as a path. Well, finally, we come up some tie steps and back onto a paved, oh, I'm sorry, before that, along the trail, there's this house, which is, um, again, a modernist house with unpainted wood and big windows. It has a balcony, it goes all around it. To me, it kind of reminds of, of Japanese architecture. I, I did live in Japan for about 13 years, so it just has that feel for me. Well, finally, we come up some tie steps um, and back onto paved road and, um, off to the right, we have this view of, of Tilden Park uh, over the roofs of, of some of the houses. Then we continue along uh, Vistamont a little bit farther. There's kind of a T intersection. We go left on Rosemont, and then we go right on, or back on Woodmont, but uh, going downhill on, on another section of Woodmont. Um, and at the second house on the right, which is 571 Woodmont, was the home of John Carboni. Um, and uh, the house itself was built in 1939, but it was significantly renovated and expanded in 1990. Some elements of the original house, we could, which we can see here on the left, are, in, are still in the house. I mean, the, door, the, the, uh, the, the main doorway is, is where it was in the original house, and there's a different window here, but the, you know, there is a window in this section, so it, uh, unfortunately, this picture, the, the picture I have, doesn't show the whole house, but uh, some of the original house is still there. Well, the interesting thing about the house is John Carboni. John R. Carboni immigrated to the U.S. from Italy in 1883 at the age of 18, and he came to Berkeley around 1888, so he would have been 23, I guess. And he was working as a gardener, and he was rapidly expanding his nursery business, which was originally between 4th and 5th streets at Alston Way in Berkeley. Um, and he started off with roses and carnations, and you can see an old nursery full of uh, 
John in Old Nursery Full of Carnations in the left photo here. Um, and he then shifted his focus to orchids, uh, where he uh, attained an impressive reputation for new cultivars and hybrids, and he was known as the Orchid King. Uh, he won Best of Show at the 1915 Panama Pacific International Exposition in San Francisco and many subsequent prizes. Um, Carboni also became active in, in Berkeley City Affairs, Civic Affairs. I've seen him when he was on one of the floats in a parade. Um, but with increasing industrialization in West Berkeley, he bought land in the Woodlawn area um, in 1925, 1929 for his nurseries, which uh, extended uh, uh, quite a bit down, uh, down Woodmont Avenue. Um, and he built his home here that we noted earlier uh, near the top of the property in 1937. Um, the business went to his son who retired in 1959 and a daughter and grandson thereafter. Um, with, uh, with lower demand and rising costs, the three acres of nurseries, including the greenhouses, there were eight greenhouses in fact, uh, were closed and the land was sold for subdivision during the 1990s. But here you can see the greenhouse. These are probably his sons here, but here's the greenhouse for the orchids and there's uh, John as an older guy with holding some of his prized orchids. Well, we continue down uh, Woodmont and we get to um, near the bottom of the hill. Um, and the right is a place called Marillark Farms. Um, there is um, a sizable garden. It's uh, surrounded by a fence you can see here. Uh, next to the driveway. The original home and garden was built in 1941 by the great uncle, uh, great aunt and uncle of the current owner. Um, they combined their names, Marie and Larkin Smith, to make Marillark. Um, to honor their dedication to home and community, uh, a Marillark sign was put up uh, by the grandnephew um, in 1997. Um, and to instill a passion for urban uh, food gardening, the current residence, Charlie Costello, has a community seed bank pictured here uh, in front, and he gives away hundreds of tomatoes and other crops each year. They're often just put out in front on the bench for, for people to take. Well, at the end of the property, which is at the bo very bottom of the hill, uh, Woodmont ends, and there's a Marillark sign is there. Um, and this is um, Wildcat Canyon Road. Now, you can't see it, but off to the left from here, there'd be an intersection where Spruce Road comes up and meets Grizzly Peak. When it crosses Grizzly Peak, it becomes Wildcat Ro Canyon Road, which goes for a while along the edge of Tilden Park and then actually goes into Tilden Park. So we're going to move a little bit uh, to the right along the street, carefully cross, because listening as well as looking, because cars come and bicycles come pretty fast around the, the curves here. Um, and we're going to find a, uh, on, the, on the left side, there's a low fence, and there's an opening in the fence that uh, takes us right onto this trail. And this is the start of the Selby Trail, and we're going to enter Tilden Park. But before we enter Tilden Park, I think it's, it's uh, good to talk a little bit our, about a real treasure, which is the East Bay Regional Park System. Um, there, uh, it, it started over 100 years ago when a number of, uh, oh, well, almost 100 years ago, when a number of local citizens and leaders in the 1920s envisioned a regional park system for the East Bay. And in 1930, they got the renowned landscape uh, design firm of Frederick Law Olmsted to sur survey potential lands and issued a report called Proposed Park Reservation um, that gave further impetus to this effort. Um, UC President Robert Sprawl and also Robert Sibley, who is executive director of the UC Alumni Association, headed up a group of a thousand East Bay citizens who advocated for the idea. Um, the governor uh, signed into law um, in 1933, a bill that created uh, California's first regional park special district. Um, and then in 1934, during the depths of the Great Depression, um, citizens of Alameda and Contra Costa counties uh, voted by 71% in favor to fund the park with the taxes. Also helping in the establishment of the park system was a sizable grant from the trust set up by the family of Israel Khan, uh, who had immigrated from Germany and founded Kahn's Department Store in Oakland in 1879, uh, a business which was carried on by his, his sons. So the first three parks opened uh, December 18th, 1936, uh, which were a uh, small park, uh, Temescal here, um, one called uh, Round Top, 
which uh, later changed its name to Sibley um, in honor of Robert Sibley. Um, and then the third one was called uh, Upper uh, Wildcat uh, Canyon, um, and that, that became uh, Tilden Park up here. Um, and that was named for Charles Leet Tilden, who was an attorney and businessman, uh, former major in the military, who was one of the leaders promoting the park district, and he was the first president of the board. Uh, other board members include August Volmer, uh, a pathbreaking Berkeley police chief, uh, Leroy Goodrich, an Oakland attorney, uh, Thomas Roberts, a local leader, uh, labor leader, and uh, Roberts uh, Recreation Area is named for him, um, and uh, Dr. Aurelia Reinhardt, who was the president of F. Mills College. She was the first woman on the board, and the Red and Redwood Park was uh, renamed in her honor last year. Um, uh, a big uh, public uh, celebration was held at the 1936 opening, shown in this picture, and also picture is uh, a bust of, of Major Charles uh, Lee Tilden. Um, there are now over 60 parks and preserves, as well as numerous trails um, that connect up uh, park spaces. Um, this makes an area of 195 square miles. Um, that comprises, according to my calculations, impressive 13% of the total uh, 1,455 uh, square miles uh, is the combined area of the parks in Alameda and Contra Costa County, uh, where the parks are located. Um, and the park does, district is not done growing. They are, they are still adding on. Um, and this is not counting uh, Mount Diablo State Park, which adds another 30 square miles. Um, the East Bay uh, Mud uh, Reservoir lands that are mostly open to the public, um, and also uh, other uh, uh, protected open space such as the uh, Muir Heritage uh, lands. So uh, we are very fortunate to have such a such a large area as protected open space that is that is open to the public. Um, now Greenbelt Alliance was founded in 1958, so so we weren't around for the founding of the East Bay Regional Park District, but Greenbelt Alliance has helped to promote the creation of other open space districts and the expansion of parks and open space districts around the Bay Area as well as the protection uh, of agricultural lands, watersheds, and natural habitats. Um, we've also advocated for better urban planning and endorsed uh, many developments that provide more affordable housing. Okay, well, that's our pitch for East Bay Regional Parks and Greenbelt Alliance. And we're gonna continue our walk now. Um, this is the route we're gonna take. Um, this map doesn't quite show Woodmont. Woodmont Emmett is down here at the lower right. But we, we came uh, along uh, Wildcat Canyon Road and we entered the park here where we saw that first photo. Um, we're going to follow um, the trail along here and then make a loop uh, through Tilden and come back. Um, and uh, we're going to be able to enjoy a rich variety of plants that, uh, that complement our pleasant urban walk. When we enter the Selby Trail, you may notice the vegetation on both sides has been largely cut back. This is because of a goat grazing program that takes place on some of the border areas of this and other parks, where there is concern about the possibility of wildfire spreading to urban areas. Uh, the photo is actually taken at nearby Zedjana College, but it, um, you'd see, you would have seen uh, at an appropriate time the, the same kind of thing with a whole lot of goats in, in an area that was kind of fenced off while they, they grazed the stuff to try and reduce the, uh, the amount of material that might burn. Um, and here's the picture of what it looks like uh, somewhat after the goat grazing on the, on the, uh, the trail. Um, the, uh, I don't, in my observation, um, it seems to leave a lot of uh, non-native blackberry and poison oak, which is native, um, that then kind of dominate the landscape. I, I'm not an expert on this, but the Sierra Club I know has been concerned that is this the best way to really treat the area to reduce fire hazard? But you can understand the East Bay Mud, uh, I'm sorry, East Bay Regional Park. Um, did I say East Bay Mud earlier? East Bay Regional Park uh, desire to do something to try and reduce uh, fire spreading from, from the parks, which, for which you know, they could be held liable. And that's particular, of course, concerned with, with the disastrous fires we've, we've had this year. Well, 
Um, we, we, the, the Selby Trail only went a little ways before, before we turned left down the uh, Memory Trail, which um, has some, some wood tie steps there. Some of them are quite steep. Um, but after going through that open area that's a little less attractive where they've been the grocery, the, the grazing, uh, we enter uh, the woods and uh, there's a, uh, a live oak tree which seems to be bending over almost back down towards the ground again. Uh, so then we uh, keep descending. Uh, this part of the trail gets a little bit steep and it's been uh, somewhat eroded into a gully here, so we're going to have to watch our step. Uh, we go down another steep section down that point, and then we actually turn and go back the other way because we're now uh, above uh, the uh, a ravine uh, in which there's a seasonal creek that feeds into Wildcat Creek. Um, and there's a bridge across that section of the uh, of this uh, tributary creek. Um, in the foreground, they, somebody put in this area some stepping stones because it's a place that gets fairly muddy in the rainy season. When we cross the bridge and look down, there we see there are some uh, there's some fairly uh, large areas of stone that create little cascades. And um, this picture was taken recently, so um, there's a wet spot in the rock. So there's a little trickle of water even at this late point in in the dry season on this particular bit of creek. So then we continue, oops, wait a minute. There's this big bay laurel that's down over the trail. Um, well, it's been there for a while, although I have the feeling it's, it's kind of edging lower. Um, bay laurel, if, as long as some of the roots are still on the ground, they can keep going after they fall over. Um, and the, the new, the branches will go straight up from, from there. So we have to stoop down to get under this um, quite a bit. It's, it gets a little harder as we get older, but <laughs> we finally wake, make our way uh, under that, and we continue along. Um, we cross another wooden bridge where there's a couple of culverts that bring some uh, some more water under the uh, under the park road, and then we get to the park road. Um, we're going to cross the park road here, and um, we have to be careful because cars tend to come pretty fast, and there's some curves, so you you can't see them until they're getting somewhat closer. So we'll listen as well as look, and we'll cross over, and we get to. Um, there's a little bit of a railing for some steps going up to continue the memory trail. Um, and oh, there's some symbols here. We're entering the Tilden Nature Area. So bicycles and dogs are not allowed. So I hope you didn't bring any of those along because they can't continue on this part of the trail. Well, we go along this part of the trail. There used to be a lot of uh, blue gum eucalyptus uh, on this trail. And they cut them down both to improve the habitat for native plants um, and because uh, they, they can uh, become a, a very significant fire danger. Um, however, they're, they're pretty persistent. And if you don't treat the stumps quite right or don't get up the seeds, you end up with new shoots of eucalyptus, as we see in this photo. Well, then um, a little bit after that, um, we, we go around kind of a curve. We're now fairly high above the road, so it's a little quieter here. Um, and uh, we come into the section where it's actually uh, predominantly native plants, um, very, very small number of, of non-native plants. Um, and one of those is the big leaf maple. And here we can see uh, just above us, uh, some of the, the leaves that you can kind of see why they got their name, the pretty big leaves. Um, and then, up here on the right, it's quite a tall tree. So there's that's more maple leaves, but they're way they're much much higher. Um, these dark leaves here are, are bay laurel. Something else that's quite common along this trail um, is the California hazelnut uh, tree, which is it's kind of between a shrub and a small tree, and you can see um, it it often grows with uh, a clump of of uh, numerous trunks. Um, the leaves, which are kind of serrated ovals, are in the spring and early summer, they're really soft and velvety. They're quite nice to touch. But it is a hazelnut. It, it actually produces filberts, but uh, you'd be hard put to find them generally because um, it, it doesn't produce a whole lot of nuts. And those that it does produce are quickly nabbed by squirrels and other animals. Well, then to come to a place where uh, right next to each other, we can 
identify uh, the two kinds of ferns that you'll most commonly find on uh, Bay Area forest trails. On the lower right is the sword fern, um, and uh, probably because, I don't know, maybe they, the leaves that look like little swords. Um, it's called single pinnate, um, and pinnate uh, refers to, uh, it comes from the Latin word pinnatus, which means feather. And you can see that it, it does kind of look like a, a, a feather. Um, and the pinna, which are the little parts that come out from the main stem, are alternate, meaning they're, they're not directly across from each other, they alternate on each side of the stem. Um, the other kind that we see commonly is the wood fern in the upper left picture, and that one is double pinnate. So here's the pinna that come out from the main stem, but they in turn are subdivided um, into further little pinna. Um, and this one, it tends to be not as glossy. The leaves are not as glossy as, as those of the wood fern. Then we come to what's a, a rare plant and considered kind of endangered um, in the Bay Area, which is Western leatherwood. Um, and it has these kind of rounded leaves. Um, some of the, th those are Bay Laurel leaves, but the, this, this is the, the leatherwood here. Um, and it's good set name because the, um, the branches are very pliable. I mean, you can practically bend them around in a circle. Um, and the flowers come out in January, February. It's one of the first things to come into bloom. Um, in our woodlands, and I, so I couldn't get my own picture of one at this time, and I grabbed this one off the, the internet, but they're lovely little uh, yellow flowers that, that dangle down. Um, there used to be a lot, I used to see a lot of, um, or relatively a lot, of leatherwood along this trail. Um, unfortunately, there's fairly few now. Um, someone has been poaching them, um, probably to cutting off, you know, most of the stalk to plant them and, and grow them somewhere else, um, which is a shame. But it's important to remember that um, it's not permit, it's, it's prohibited to take any plants, animals, or mushrooms, whatever, from, uh, from the East Bay parks. Um, the, probably the most common berry on our trails is the native blackberry. Um, and you can tell this one because it has the leaves in groups of three. Uh, which has kind of grooved veins in them. Um, and the thorns uh, on the stems are um, not too large. Um, it, uh, it doesn't produce a whole lot of berries, uh, but it's, it's, it can spread quite a bit when, when it has the area to do so. Um, but there's also uh, spreading in a lot of places the non-native Asian or Himalayan blackberry, um, which has leaves in groups of five, it has uh, much bigger, nastier looking uh, thorns and, and branches. And the um, unfortunate thing about it is that it produces a lot more luscious berries. Um, and so it tends to be spread by uh, birds and other animals. And uh, it can kind of crowd out native plants. And it can also be a hazard for hikers if the branch sticks out into the, um, into the trail because they're, they're pretty nasty thorns. Well, now we come to an intersection. There's another trail that comes up from the right here. Um, and we've been on the memory trail, but going forward from this part, it becomes the upper pack rat trail. Um, and generally it's, it's a trail in fairly good condition, although it's, it's a single track trail though, but it's, uh, it's, it's in pretty good condition for, for, for walking. Um, something you're also likely to see in, uh, in woodlands is the vine honeysuckle, which is, is a true vine. It grows up and over other things um, and uh, has pretty pink flowers in, uh, in the springtime that look like the, the eastern, the white and yellow eastern honeysuckle flowers, but it doesn't have the fragrance that the eastern honeysuckle has. However, it produces these berries, which are first green, and then they turn a dull red, and then they turn this kind of translucent red. And they're quite lovely, but, uh, but unfortunately, they're not edible. Um, there's uh, hard to hike anywhere in California without seeing this native, uh, which has some of our best autumn colors. And although it actually started, they colors start in the summer. Uh, unfortunately, it's poison oak um, that can cause severe skin rash. Um, 
And they say that without treatment, it takes uh, two weeks to get rid of the rash. Uh, but with treatment, uh, you can usually get rid of it in just 14 days. Well, it follows the old adage um, that uh, leaves of three, leave them be. Um, and that also goes for uh, native blackberry, which has prickles on the back of the leaves. Um, the scientific name is Toxicodendron, so it's toxic. <laughs> and in the same family is poison ivy in the Eastern US and another plant used to make the lacquer for Japanese and Chinese decorative arts, but that could also cause skin problems, so if, if it's not handled properly. Um, poison oak can grow in various habitats as a vine, a ground cover, a shrub, um, and the leaves uh, can come in different shapes, though always in threes. Um, and I mean, it, drought never seems to, I, I've, you know, severe drought and poison oak is, seems to be continuing to do fine. Moreover, when it burns, it can put out toxic smoke, which is uh, another hazard for, for our brave firefighters. Um, another shrub you'll see along this trail um, has uh, e uh, kind of long elliptical leaves that have tiny teeth along the edge. And this is the coffee berry. Um, it produces small flowers and then the, uh, the berries um, are originally green and they turn kind of yellowy brown uh, and red, and then they finally get to a very dark color that looks almost like uh, it's, it's black or brown. And supposedly they, they thought the berry is somewhat similar to coffee, but it's, it's not at all related to, to the to coffee plant. Um, but the Native Americans apparently use the berries to make a, a drink for constipation. So the upper Pacre Trail is mainly, we're, we're up on this, following kind of the contour of the slope above uh, Wildcat Creek. And um, in heavy rain, sometimes it gets, here's a section that was eroded. Now, when I went just a couple days ago, um, this section of the trail was actually closed off and there were signs of treads when some sort of small scale construction machinery. So they may have been working to uh, improve this section of the trail or um, or some other hazard that was along the trail. Um, a couple weeks ago it was it was open, but a couple days ago it was closed, hopefully just temporarily. Um, here's some big leaves on another plant that's, um, they look kind of like maples, but uh, this is the thimbleberry, and it can grow up to six feet tall. Um, it produces berries that has five petal white flowers, and after that berries that look uh, very much and taste somewhat like raspberries. And because of the thimble shape of the berries, it's called the, the thimbleberry. Well, while we pass, we pass mostly native plants on this trail, there's some non-natives. Um, and one of them is a non-native holly that we think of as a, a Christmas plant. Um, it's not really native to our area. Um, it has these shiny leaves with very sharp uh, uh, prickles on the edges of the leaves, um, and it has, uh, uh, of course, red berries. Now, we have a plant that we call California holly. We also call it toyon or Christmas berry. Um, and um, it also has shiny green leaves with little prickles. Not, they're not nearly as sharp as the ones on holly. And it also produces uh, red berries uh, late in the year. Um, so, uh, People call it California holly, but it's not actually related uh, as a plant. It's not related to holly. Um, I think the Native Americans supposedly used um, the berries as, as part of their trail mix. Um, in any case, um, in some places, um, it can grow uh, to kind of tree size. And in Southern California, there were uh, these, these uh, tall growing California holly trees. So they named the area Hollywood. Um, which is, uh, is important to remember, it's named after our native plant, uh, not that interloper. Well, now we crossed uh, another uh, seasonal creek. Uh, this one was, is dry at this time uh, on a wooden bridge. I'm not quite sure where the posts are. Are they trying to discourage bicycles, which are not supposed to be on this trail anyway? Or um, I'm not quite sure why they put these metal posts at each end of the trail. Well, gradually we're descending on the trail, so we're getting more into riparian area. And one of the plants we find here is the creek dogwood. Um, and this is related to the, the dogwood 
in the east that has the uh, the white, the pretty white and pink uh, flowers, which um, you can find planted in yards around the Bay Area. Um, but this one doesn't have such impressive looking flowers. Uh, of course, even the the dogwood, the eastern dogwood, the things that we think are petals aren't petals; they're bracts. It's it's like a specialized leaf that takes on a color, like as in poinsettias and some some other plants. Um, but uh, this this is uh, one of our native dogwoods, anyway. Uh, one thing is to keep an eye out is for uh, presence of animals and this uh, branches of this plant looks like it's obviously been browsed probably by by deer so uh, sometimes we can see the evidence of animals when we can't see the animals themselves although the last time two days ago I did see deer on this trail well here's a there, along the trail there the, the the view kind of opens up and we can see this is the riparian area of trees along uh, Wildcat Creek and the distance is a forest of, of big tall uh, uh, blue or, or uh, blue gum eucalyptus. Uh, well, we haven't focused too much on California live oak, but it's probably the most common tree in the Bay Area, um, the coastal live oak. Um, and this one I found there was a particularly photogenic set of, of acorns for us to look at. And it also shows their um, they're uh, glossy leaves which tend to turn down around the edges and they have little prickles on the edge which is to discourage uh, them from being browsed. Well as we get further down the plant, the, getting closer to the creek, the plants grow even more heavily. They have to really prune them back every year or they, kind of, they want to take over the trail. Um, this is another shrub, shrub that's quite common on the trail. It's called nine bark partly because of the kind of peely bark it has. Um, and it has uh, bunches of small white flowers um, that, that the fruits then come out as these kind of pods that are red and then turn brown and, and open up to drop the seeds. Um, and then there's a plant called uh, Rosilla, which tends to grow in wetter areas. Um, these little spheres are made up of hundreds of tiny little uh, florets um, and the uh, Native Americans apparently made a, a kind of uh, a reddish dye from them. Uh, well, finally, we come to a fork and we go to the left and what? Wait a minute, where's Jewel Lake? Um, well, Jewel Lake is hardly there right now. Um, people are calling it Jewel Puddle. Um, what has happened is that over many years, um, since a dam was built to create a lake, it is silted up. Um, and with the drought, um, they're, they're not letting any water come down Wildcat Creek to this point. So uh, it's drying up. There, there have been talking for a number of years about possibly dredging uh, to, to make the lake deeper so it holds more water. Um, but um, it doesn't seem that anything is happening. Um, so that's... Uh, it's kind of sad. Here is what uh, the lake looked like in more normal times, and maybe it'll get back to this if we have a good rainy season. Um, but uh, they they did take out. Uh, there was a lot of perch, fairly good sized perch in the pond. They moved them to other places to rescue them, as the as the lake got smaller. Um, and there, but there used to be a lot of waterfall here. I, I saw one egret, which it looked kind of sad because it was just you know this little puddle left uh, the other day. Um, so I kind of miss the lake, but people point out, well, it wasn't really a natural lake. Um, it was created by a dam, um, by a group of, it was actually kind of like, sort of like a commune, but this was before hippie communes. This is further back um, in Bay Area history. A group who was, had formed this community um, with a farm on lower Wildcat Creek, and they, they created a dam here with a pond for, for their, water, their summer water supply. Um, then um, it was part of, uh, uh, there were some small, a, a bunch of small water companies. Um, eventually, of course, East Bay Mud uh, took over um, the, the water supply for the, East, uh, for the East Bay, I think from about the 1930s. Um, and they built a big reservoir in the Sierras and other local larger reservoirs. So this one is really no longer needed. It's, it's of course, part of Tilton Park nature area. Um, they are, I noticed recently, they have built 
they've constructed some new ponds that um, uh, are meant to be seasonal ponds for, for certain kinds of wildlife. Uh, we're going back on the Lower Packard Trail, um, where there's kind of heavy growth of plants because it's close to the water table, so the oak trees get pretty tall. Um, the willow trees also get pretty tall. Um, there's bay laurel, which the leaves, you know, is related to bay leaves that we use in culinary. You can use this culinary, they're about 10 times as strong, but I've cooked with them. Um, and it's related to the, to the laurel trees of classical Greece and Rome. So the laurel wreaths, you know, and Nobel laureate, you know, it's all come from that word uh, laurel. Um, the sword fern I saw here was kind of interesting the way it splays out in all directions. Um, this is uh, a, a willow, which I guess, you know, willowy comes from the word willow. This one kind of bends around in almost a circle. Um, the lower pack of trail is mostly flat, but there's one place where we have to go up some tie steps. Um, there's an alternative to the lower pack of trail on the other side of the creek. There's a boardwalk path, but um, with COVID-19, it's become one way going against the direction we wanted to go. And there's not much to see because there's no water in, it goes over wetlands area and there's no water in it right now. Um, elderberry is another plant that's common to see and there's both red and blue elderberry. The red are uh, not edible, the blue are edible. I don't know if they're very tasty, but you can make jam or wine or something out of them. Um, and generally the red elderberry grows along the coast and the blue inland. So Tilden Nature Area is one of the few places where you can find both of them in one place. Oh, well, then we come to this place where the basal uh, part of the trunks of the of the uh, bay laurel trees are <laughs> have made the path uh, very narrow. But but we work our way through to this uh, place where there's well we would be the trail would be right next to the creek here except the creek is dried up. But that would be the creek bed. Um, snowberry is another shrub we come across that um, has its name for obvious reasons seeing the wet berries. Um, here's another place where the roots of the trees and the trunks are trying to take over a trail, but we work our way through. Uh, we get to a, an improved section, which is, I think, a muddy area. So they've, they've uh, made the trail that's uh, better for when the, in the rainy season. Um, we come out at Little Farm. Unfortunately, Little Farm is closed because of COVID-19. So we'll come back with our lettuce and our celery sometime later maybe to feed the animals. You can see some of the, uh, I guess their cows are up here. Um, and next to the parking lot when we come out, there's uh, this wonderful big gnarly live oak tree with branches going all over the place. Well, we have made our circuit. Um, we, from that point, we come up a fairly steep trail that has, in parts, that has some steps. We go back the memory trail um, and the uh, pick up the little bit of the Selby Trail. We're back Wellcat Canyon. We go back just a little way. So we go up Woodmont. We turn right on Rosemont. Um, we bear right on Creston, and we're back at our starting point at Grizzly Peak Boulevard over here. So um, I just wanted to say that um, the um, Greenbelt Alliance, as we mentioned, has a new strategic plan emphasizing resilience. Um, we, we still want to, uh, to uh, protect um, our, our open space and improve things in our cities, uh, but we're putting a, an emphasis on how we're being resilient to climate change, which means not building in places prone to fire, flooding, and sea level rise, while better preparing our towns and cities. Now, a very important election is coming up, um, but there's many issues besides just the presidential race. And on the Greenbelt Alliance webpage under resources, you can find the local ballot measures uh, we endorse around the Bay Area. And um, okay, I'm gonna stop sharing here. I think, well, I don't know if anybody has any questions. Um, do we have any questions on the Q&A? Should I, let's see. I guess I have to stop sharing to see that part. Were there any questions in the QA? Oh, no open questions. Okay. If anybody want, has a question, yeah, they can. I have a question verbally. Sorry, Bob. Um, sure. Go ahead. I think there's a hand raising feature. You can raise your hand and then I can hop in and try to unmute you so you can. 
Where, where is the hand raising feature for them to find it? That's a good question. Let me see. I have Elaine is asking a question now, so I'm going to allow Elaine to talk. Okay. Hi, Elaine. Oh, you have to unclick here in the lower left where your name is. Uh, you have to click to so that we can hear you. Oh, there you go. Okay. All right. Hi. Oh, now I lost your picture. But all right. Um, Bob, I just wanted to praise your job. You did a great job. I always enjoy these, but I did miss the beginning. So if there is a video that I can access anytime in the near future, would you send it on to me? Okay, I'll, I'll try and do that. And I think, uh, Ken, we're also going to pose, uh, put up a recording on the web, Greenbelt website. Is that right? Right. I believe it'll, it'll be on our Facebook page in a few days. On the Facebook page. Jesse? Okay, if you can send that to me as well, then I'll forward it to Lane or anybody else who might be interested. In yeah, I just want to let Thanks, everyone know for um, attendees, we will send a follow-up email early next week, um, and it will include a link to the video, oh, okay. um, as well as some additional information about Greenbelt Alliance. Okay? Okay. Great. All right. I see there's some things in chat. Um, oh, I hope you could talk about the state of Jewel Lake. Yeah. Well, a plans to dredge it. Uh, well, there have been plans, but I, it doesn't seem anything is happening. Uh, maybe it's too expensive. I, I don't know. Uh, okay. How far did we walk? Um, that's a good question. Um, I would say as much as two miles. Uh, something like that, because uh, walking it took me well over an hour. It could have been more than two miles. I have to go back and measure it sometime. We have another question here, so I'm gonna. Yes. Oh, it looks like you're using an older version of Zoom. Um, is it Jack or Jacques? Uh, sorry. So if you want to. Send your question via chat. We can make sure and cover it. Sorry about that. Yeah, otherwise, other people, if you want to talk where, where you're, it shows up your name in, in the lower left corner, I think you have to click on the thing to take you off mute so we can hear you. Oh, okay. Somebody said uh, it's about three miles. We do this walk often. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. I don't know if that includes the section with the bit on Widmont that we did. Um, but if you want to see more of that area of Berkeley, you can go to our, our website, uh, berkeleywalks.com, and, and download uh, the walk for Berkeley, Berkeley Woods, um, which includes that and what we saw today and, and some more as well including Zaytuna College, the first uh, Muslim liberal arts college in the US. Any other questions or comments? Were there any, did I oh, miss it looks like Steve has a question, let me. Okay. Hello, Steve. There you go. Unmute myself here. Okay. Um, I, I was just uh, curious about the uh, subdivision of the Carboni orchid. Uh, yes. Um, I think you said something, uh, and I wasn't not sure I got it right, but I think you said that it was subdivided in the in the nineties. No, in the oh, but it uh, was. Did I say that? I, I meant the sixties. I think it was the nineteen sixties. It was the it was the end of the sixties. Yeah, we actually live on the property. Oh, and, okay. And we we brought some orchids that were car whose name was Carboni. Oh. Back to the property when we moved in here. Ah. Oh, great. So we. Well, I think you're part of the one that's a community that has a sort of its own pool. No, well, that isn't that. Is, that's what we thought when we moved in. Oh. But but in fact, the pool is a completely autonomous. Thing and you have to buy in. Oh, you have to buy in as a member. Uh -huh. People from from uh, quite a distance away that uh, uh -huh. are part of the pool, and a yeah. lot of people near the pool that are not members. 
yeah, I'm not sure how many houses are on the former uh, Carboni property, but there must be a fair number. Yeah, yeah. It's, the, it's the whole block uh, except for two or three lots on the very top end. Yeah, I think it goes down to where Vistamont comes back into. Yeah, exactly. The Woodmont, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, it's it's kind of a fun area to visit because there's such a variety of, of houses and the uh, and 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 all the trees and, and and nice gardens and things. Right. Any other? Thank you very much. This was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you for pointing that out. I'm, I'm sorry if I said the 90s, it was yeah, 60s <laughs> subdivided. Great. Uh, okay. Um, well, thanks. Uh, thank you very, uh, very much, everyone, for attending today. And um, I hope you'll. Uh, uh, Join Greenbelt for the Savor the Greenbelt event if you can. Um, it should be a fun thing. All right, thanks very much.